Hello everybody. Now welcome back to another lesson. Uh, we're going to be talking about the change of variables in multiple integrals. In some textbooks this is known as uh, substitutions in multiple integrals. Now what I'm going to do to start off is I'm going to have you guys recall I'm going to have you guys uh, recall this topic from Calc 1. All right. And this topic from Calc 1, you'll see what it is in just a little bit. Uh, from Calc 1, we know that if we have an integral moving from A to B, and this is for some function that has a function composition, f of g of x, and it's multiplied by g prime of x dx, then this integral can be evaluated by making a nice substitution where we typically denote this as some function u that is made for g of x, where u is equal to g of x as such. Now, this method from Calc 1 is your substitution method that we used. What we want to do now is we kind of want to extract that more into uh, multiple integrals now. So not just working with one integral, but now doing this with multiple integrals. Now, it's not going to be as straightforward as it was here. It's not just about choosing some function that's going to be doing some composition and then moving with that. All right. So right below here is where I have this drawing uh, that we're going to start off with. Now, we typically start in our domain. We're going to say we're going to start off with a domain D. And domain D is going to be on some U and V axes. All right, so that's just to start off. And what we're going to do is we're going to apply some sort of transformation. And this is our transformation function. We're going to apply some transformation, G, and that transformation is going to take all of these pairs in this domain and it's going to send them to a different domain or a different what we call image. All right. So the domain or sorry, the transformation is taking points from your domain. It's going to transform them and it's going to call them the image once it's done with that transformation. On here, I have a point P. If I take point P, I apply the transformation. What I get is I get the evaluation of point P through that function G that we used as a transformation. I will always refer to this part as the image. Every time we have a domain, we apply a transformation. We will arrive at some image of G. All right. So, what we have here on the right hand side is that I'm saying my function G is going to be a transformation that's going to take my domain and it's going to transform it into some values in R squared two, or sorry, in R space two. This transformation G, this function that I'm going to be observing or that I'm going to be looking for is going to be in terms of UV but all of these UV transformations or all of these UV variables are going to be corresponding to some function X and Y that's going to be transformed into R space two. All right, there's a lot going on there, but we'll hopefully cover it with a good example in just a little bit. Typically, these transformations that we want, we want these to be a one to one function. And again, typically. That way, once we extract this function, or once we come up with this function g, then we're allowed to go from the domain to its image, and then we're allowed to go from its image back to its domain. That's why we want it to be a one-to-one. -one. If it's not a one-to-one -one function, then this transformation only works one way, and we won't be able to go backwards. We would have to define a different function to get us there. All right. So. Now that we have this intro, let's start looking at an example. That way we can start seeing how this is going to be applied. All right. So here goes your first example. We want to find the image of the triangle. 
of the triangle, let's call this T, with vertices 1, 2, 2, 1, and 3, 4 under the linear map which is given as G of UV is equal to 2U minus V comma U plus V. All right, so for this example, what they're asking us is they're saying, hey, I want you to observe this triangle. When you have this triangle, we then want to apply this linear map and you're gonna get a new region that region is gonna be called your image. All right, so let's now go through and let's start seeing what all of these points are gonna be once we apply their transformation. All right, so one of the key phrases here, one of the key phrases here is that we have a linear map. If we have a linear map, that's going to be good for us because that's going to tell us that this point is just going to be linearly transformed, which means we're not going to have two outputs. We're only going to have that one output. And again, because we have that one to one aspect for this transformation. All right. Same thing with two, one and same thing with three, four. Now, since they're giving us this transformation, all of these ordered pairs that they're giving us, this is UV this is UV and this is UV. So really quickly, let's go ahead and let's look at what this is looking like under uh, this transformation feature or under this U and V axis. So really quickly, I want you to try to sketch that under the U and V axis and see what you get. All right, I'm gonna go to GeoGebra and I'm gonna show you guys what I get there. So uh, follow me along. All right, I'm here on GeoGebra. If we go down to our class, here we are. And I have a change of variables example right down here for areas, and I'm just gonna click on it. And here's that triangle. What, I'm, what I did here is I labeled uh, the triangle A, B, and C. Tri uh, vertex A is ordered pair one, two. Vertex B is two, one. Vertex C is three, four. All right, those were the ordered pairs that were given to us. Once I did that, I just drew the triangle there and I have the area calculated. Awesome. So this is what it should look like, that region. That's gonna be the domain D that we're analyzing. So before I show the image of the triangle, I'm gonna go back and I'm gonna start extracting what points we have to look at. All right, so follow me along back to the board. All right, here we are. So let's go ahead and let's start working with this. All right, I'm gonna grab the first ordered pair. So my first ordered pair is that ordered pair for one, two. Once I have this ordered pair, what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna apply the transformation to it. All right, so the transformation that I'm applying here is that this piece for my function, for my transformation, this is my X coordinate, and this here is my Y coordinate which means under this transformation, we are given that X is equal to two U minus V and Y is equal to U plus V. So when I have this ordered pair of one, two, I'm then gonna say X is equal to two times U, which is one minus V, which is two, which means X is zero. Y in this case is just one plus two, which is three. So my new ordered pair, once I apply the transformation, is going to be zero, three. All right, so here I applied the transformation. Oops. So I applied the transformation G. Good. Now let's go ahead and let's do the other one, or the other two. So now I have two, one. Let's do the same thing. That's gonna give us three. The Y value, that's gonna be two plus one. That's gonna get us three. 
which means my new ordered pair is 3, 3. So the ordered pair 2, 1, once I apply this transformation, gets transformed into 3, 3. The last ordered pair, which is 3, 4, let's see, x is going to be 2 times 3 minus 4, that should get us 2, and then y is going to be 3 plus 4, which will get us 7. So its new transformation is 2, 7. There we are. And again, I applied my transformation g. Perfect. All right, so now that we have these new ordered pairs, let's go ahead and let's graph these new ordered pairs. Because all of these new ordered pairs are now going to be in terms of x's and y's. So let's look at the x's and y's now on the same grid and see what we actually get. All right, so let's go ahead, follow me over to GeoGebra. All right, so here we are on GeoGebra. Let's go ahead and let's uh, look at the image. Now on this applet, what I did is I created the triangle here and I showed you the area. And what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna click on this button here that says show the image of the triangle. Here we are. This is the image that we transformed it to. This point A got transformed over to A prime. Remember, point A, that was point one, two. According to our work, the point one, two got transformed to the point zero, three. Point B was the point at two, one. And this one got transformed over to here, which was three, three. The last one was three, four, and it got transformed over to two, seven. And there we have it. Now I labeled all of these as A prime, B prime, C prime. So you can see that A goes with A, B goes with B, and C goes with C. Now look at the area here of this new transformation or this new transformed region. The area of the new transformed region is six, but the initial area was two. So there is some discrepancy happening here that we then need to investigate. The two areas are not equal to one another. All right, so that's one important feature that we then have to kind of keep in our back pocket is why are these not two equal to one another if we're applying this linear transformation that is one-to-one? -one? All right, so let's go back and let's investigate that. All right, here we are. So what I'm gonna do really quickly here is I'm gonna do this in purple, all right? So let's start looking at this. The area of triangle, and I'm gonna say this was my A, B, and C, was equal to two, and then the area of triangle A prime, B prime, C prime was six. And this over here was my A prime, this here was my B prime, and this here was my C prime. All right, now how are they correlated to one another? Well, it kind of looks like it's by a factor of three. And that's kind of what we want to keep in our back pocket is that we analyze it and we can see that, yeah, it is being scaled by a factor of three, but can we find that scale factor? That's the big question. Can we find this scale factor? Well, the answer is yes. Yes, we can. We can find that scale factor. When I started analyzing my X and Y, I put them in terms of U and Vs. What I want to do now is I want to go back into what are known as determinants. This determinant kind of shapes the area of this figure that we initially start working with. All right, so that's what I want to work with. I want to work with a determinant. So what I'm going to do here is I'm going to work with this given determinant and I'm going to put this in a different color.
here we are. I'm going to look at the partial derivatives for my functions uh, x's and y's in terms of u's and v's. So let's look at the first partial derivative with x with respect to u. That's going to be 2. The next partial derivative is x with respect to v. So the partial of x with respect to v, that's negative 1. Partial of y with respect to u gets us 1. And the partial of y with respect to v gets us 1. Applying this determinant, we can now see that it's going to be 2 times 1, which is 2, minus negative 1 times 1, which is, lo and behold, this factor of 3. So, without visually doing this, can we then extract what the areas are going to be as long as we know the first area? The answer is yes. We can do this now without looking at this graphically. This process here is what's known as your Jacobian determinant. And we're going to keep working with this Jacobian determinant to analyze what is that scale factor. All right, awesome. So, by the way, to answer the question, if we wanted to find the image of the triangle with those vertices, uh, that was the image that I was shown on GeoGebra. I'll go back and I'll show it to you really quickly. Here we are. So to answer the question, the image is just this blue triangle. That's the image. All right. So this, uh, what color is this? Like a brownish orange color. This is the initial domain. Once it got transformed, we applied the transformation and we were able to get this new triangle here, which is known as the image of our initial triangle. So this blue triangle is the image that we want to observe. Awesome. Let's go back. Here we are. All right, so let's start analyzing this Jacobian. Let's, uh, let's go ahead and let's define it a little bit more concrete. All right, so here we go. So we have that. The Jacobian determinant or just from now on going to be known as the Jacobian This Jacobian of a map, oops, excuse me, of a map G of UV, where that was defined as some X coordinate in terms of UV, some Y coordinate in terms of UV, is the determinant, which we're going to denote as the Jacobian of G, which is given by the partial derivative of X with respect to U, the partial derivative of X with respect to V, the partial derivative of Y with respect to U, and the partial derivative of Y with respect to V. All right, now typically we write this as the partial of x and y divided by oops, the partial of uv, like such. All right, so either one of these three notations, the Jacobian of g, or the determinant of the partials, or this notation here, all of this talks about the determinant or sorry, the Jacobian determinant that we are going to be looking for. All right, awesome. So how does this then apply to multivariable? Well, if you remember back in chapter 15, early chapter 15, uh, we started looking to find areas of certain regions and we were doing this with double integrals. There was also an aspect that we said, hey, double integrals don't necessarily calculate area unless the 
integrand is the constant of 1. However, we can still integrate over those areas. And that's where the double integrals came into play, saying we can still integrate over these areas. All we have to do is figure out what is the bounds for that region. Well, looking at this example, we can now work with that and saying, hey, you're going to be integrating. And if you change your variables, there's going to be a factor that you need to account for. That factor for the integrals is going to be your Jacobian. So whenever we start setting up these double integrals and we want to change the variables, we then always have to account for this Jacobian because, again, we are scaling the area by a different factor. So let's go ahead and let's write that up now visually and uh, algebraically. All right, so here's the formal, uh, the formal theorem that we're going to be working with when we're talking about this... Um, transformation or this substitution or this change of variables for these double integrals. All right, we're starting off with some initial domain D naught in the UV plane. We're going to apply some transformation G and that transformation or that mapping is then going to give us an image of this uh, new domain called D. So what we're saying here is we're saying let let G be some transformation that takes the initial domain D naught and it maps it over to a different domain. We're going to call this image a D. We want this map to be or to have continuous first order derivatives. And that mapping needs to be a one to one on the interior of D naught. Then we're going to say once that mapping is done, we're going to define a new function. This function is going to be f of x, y. If this function is continuous, then when we take the double integral for this function over this domain or over this region d with respect to dx and dy, which is what we have here, then the double integral over the initial region that was being mapped, d naught, is the double integral over the same function, except now we're using the variables using v's. And when we do this, we have to account for that integration constant or that integration factor, which is known as a Jacobian. And this is going to be in terms of du and dv. Now, we have to be very careful with this because, again, the Jacobian can sometimes be negative. As we saw from before, if we have to find that constant factor that, or that scale factor, that scale factor needs to be positive. That way we can keep talking about this area that's being integrated in terms of a positive value, which means any time that we find this Jacobian and we insert the Jacobian into our calculations, this must always be the absolute value of the Jacobian in order to preserve that one-to-one -one mapping. All right. so. Again, this is the part that we're going to need right in here. All right, this is how the Jacobian is now tying in to these double integrals. So let's start looking at this first example. So use the change of variables formula to derive the formula for integration in polar coordinates. All right, so we want to take this change of variables formula, all right, and we want to make sure that we derive the integration for polar coordinates. All right, so there's a few things that we're going to do. All right, uh, one of the few things that we're going to do is we're going to start analyzing what we have or what is the bridge between polar and Cartesian. Excuse me. That bridge that we looked at was that x is equal to r times cosine theta and y is equal to r sine theta. 
This means that if I have to build some sort of transformation, if I have to build some sort of transformation, then my transformation G will be in terms of R and theta, which means every single ordered pair that we're gonna have is going to be in terms of X's and Y's, but in here, X is R cosine theta, which means here, we're gonna have R cosine theta, and in here, we're gonna have R sine theta. This is some sort of X and this is some sort of Y, again, in terms of R's and thetas. Now, when we start off, we're gonna say, okay, well, we're gonna be looking at this double integral over some domain for f of x, y, and this is going to be dx, dy. Now, we already know the end result, but again, we have to make sure that we transfer this end result using this change of variables. So, this is now going to transform into the double integral over our new region, we'll call it d naught, all right? Or we can, you know what, let's, for this purpose, let's call it region r my function f now gets transformed using this transformation. X's are now R cosine thetas, Y's are now R sine thetas. DX, DY, well, we're gonna figure out what DX, DY is gonna transform to in just a little bit, but we know here that we're gonna need to multiply by the Jacobian of some transformation, and then this is going to be DR, D theta. So all we need to then figure out is what is this absolute value of the Jacobian that we're looking at. All right, so I'm gonna do that work here in green and I'm gonna do it on this side over here. You know what, let's do it in purple. I'm gonna do it that work right over here. So the Jacobian of G is then going to be the partial derivatives. I need the partial derivative of X. And in this case, it's going to be with respect to R. All right, right here, with respect to R, then I'm gonna need the partial derivative of X with respect to theta, then the partial derivative of Y with respect to R, partial derivative of Y with respect to theta. All right, so we have this going. Let's go ahead and find that out. Partial of X with respect to R, that's going to give us cosine theta partial derivative of x with respect to theta, that's gonna give us negative r sine theta. Partial derivative of y with respect to r, that's sine theta, and then partial derivative of y with respect to theta, that's gonna be r cosine theta. There we are, nice. All right, so all we do now is multiply, all right, or get that determinant. This is now going to be r times cosine squared theta, and that's gonna be uh, minus that, so it's gonna be a plus. So it's gonna be plus r sine squared theta. And if we can factor out the r here, then we're left with cosine squared theta plus sine squared theta. But that's a Pythagorean identity, which means this is just r. So when we have to insert this Jacobian, this Jacobian is just R, so I'm gonna come over here and I'm now gonna rewrite this. Like such, the absolute value of R and just dr d theta. But the absolute value of R just means that that's gonna be positive, but by the nature of R, R must always be positive. So in this particular case, we just get r dr d theta, which is the initial formula that we got back in chapter, or back in early chapter 15. I think it was around uh, 15, three that we were able to get, or that we derived this formula that we were working with. My apologies, that was 15, four. So this is the same formula Same as uh, the double integral in 15.4. Nice. All right. 
perfect. So now we actually get to see that, hey, we were actually using this change of variables, except we weren't discussing it as a change of variables uh, back in early chapter 15. All right, so let's go through and let's do a, uh, an example that's a little bit more complicated. That way we can start seeing how we're going to be transforming these uh, specific values or these specific features. All right, so here we go. This example, we're going to say use the change of variables formula to compute. And what we want to compute here is going to be the double integral, and let me see which one do we want. We want to compute the double integral, here we go, for the region R, and this is going to be for x minus y divided by x plus y with respect to dA, where R is the region enclosed by x minus y is equal to 0, x minus y is equal to 1, x plus y is equal to 1, and x plus y is equal to 3. All right. And in here, I'm going to say use the transformation So the transformation that I'm going to give you is going to be that u is equal to x plus y and v is going to be x minus y. Now you can kind of see why this is going to be beneficial. If you notice the transformation that I'm giving you, u is actually the denominator and v is actually that numerator for that function. Typically, when you change your variables, you want to change your variables so that the resulting integral is going to be easier to evaluate. All right, so once we have this, we can now go through and we can now start uh, setting our bounds, right? How do we want to approach this? All right, well, one of the things that I'm gonna observe really quick is these guys. These are linear transformations. They're linear transformations, which is going to make this type of transformation a little bit easier to work with. All right, not necessarily easy, but just again, a little bit easier rather than uh, if the transformation was nonlinear. If the transformation is nonlinear, we could be looking at some exponential transformation, some hyperbolic transformation, some circular transformation, that's polar coordinates. All right, but in this case, again, linear transformation. So we're given these bounds. So what I'm gonna do really quickly is I want to start looking at this region that is being bounded. Notice this is all in X's and Y's. So I'm gonna start there looking at these X's and Y's and we'll see what we get. All right, so let's go through and let's start graphing this really quickly. All right, that way we can start extracting what we see and we'll be able to take it from there. All right, let's see. Whoops, let's make that black. All right, there we are so far. Now I'm also going to draw a different axis adjacent to it. Uh, that axis is going to be my UV plane. In other words, it's going to be the transformation that I'm going to 
be looking at, or it's going to be the image that I'm going to be looking at. All right, there we are. Now I'm going to label this first one. Uh, what I'm given is I'm given my X and my Y. And I'm going to go through and I'm going to start working with this. All right, so the very first one that I'm going to look at is this x plus y is equal, or sorry, x minus y is equal to zero. So when I have x minus y is equal to zero, I really have just y is equal to x, which means at this point in time, it's just going to be a line. All right, centered at the origin, or goes through the origin. Uh, then I'm gonna do this line, which is going to be x minus y is equal to one, which if we manipulate it algebraically, this is going to be x minus one. All right, doesn't look too bad. Then I'm gonna have x plus y is equal to one, and I'm gonna manipulate this to say y is equal to negative x plus one. And then the very last one, uh, let's do this in, let's say light blue. This one's going to be x plus y is equal to three, which means that y is going to be negative x plus three. You know what, we could do a, a bigger scale here. There we go. All right, perfect. All right, so Let's go with my first one here. That's one, one, and that's gonna be two, two. So let me get my ruler out here. It's somewhere there about a 45 degree angle. Nice. All right, perfect. So that one's now done. Now I'm gonna go with uh, the next one. Uh, this is going to be an intercept at negative one. All right, so I'm going to go an intercept of negative one. There's my intercept at negative one. And slope of one, so one over one, like such, two over two, so on and so forth. All right, let's get that going again. This one's going to come here. There we are. All right, it's looking good. Uh, next line, I'm gonna do that purple one, which is uh, at positive one, and then it goes negative one, negative one. So there we are. Let's get that line going for us. Looks like it's uh, about another 45 degree angle. There we are. Nice. And then the last one's gonna be up at three and it's gonna be a slope of one. So it's gonna cross back down here at three or sorry, negative one. There we are. So the area that we're focusing on that we want to transform is this area right in here. So this is my initial domain, or I believe they called it a region. Whoa, did not like that. Let's go ahead and zoom in just a little bit more. Let's delete that piece, and we want to call this our region R. There we are, perfect. Nope, what are you doing? Uh-oh, let's go back, there we go. Sorry, everybody, this uh, technology stuff is uh, <laughs> still getting used to it. And uh, it's a work in progress. All right, it's a work in progress. So there we are. So that's gonna be the region that we want to then transform. 
Now notice, uh, no matter what way we actually try to dissect this region, if we were working with this with uh, double integrals, it would be very tough to calculate uh, because we would need uh, about three double integrals in order to make this calculation work, which again, looks really tough. Now, we're gonna again transform this into some UV plane and that's going to be the integration that we're going to be looking for all right so again we want to apply some sort of transformation here so in order to apply this transformation we then have to figure out what are all of these values being transformed into all right notice here i have that u is equal to x plus y so let's look at those quick transformations then all right, so I'm gonna look at this purple line first, x plus y. All right, so I'm gonna really quickly grab this line, which was this x plus y was equal to one. Under the transformation, we get that x plus y is equal to u, which means x plus y, that's this guy, isn't this just u? Which then tells me that u must be equal to 1. Well, what does u equal to 1 look like then? Let's actually go back over here. Okay, so let's start looking at what u is equal to 1 looks like. So here we go, that line was the purple line, right? So that purple line, now instead of it being diagonal this way, that's just u is equal to one, that's just this line right here. This line was u is equal to one. Nice, okay. Well then, I also have that x plus y is equal to u, so let's see, I also have x plus y here. Well, that means that if I take x plus y is equal to three, that's by what was given to me, but now applying this transformation, this then tells me that this is u as well. So what does that imply now? Well, that now implies that u is equal to three. So this initial uh, light blue line, which was x plus three, x plus y is equal to three, now gets transformed into u is equal to three. So I'm gonna go over here to u is equal to three. There we are. I'm gonna draw my line. There it is. This is my line of u is equal to three. Okay, nice. Now let's go to my other lines. Let's go to the green line. That green line said that we had x minus y is equal to zero, but then according to my transformation, x minus y, that's just v. So that should just imply that v is equal to zero under those conditions. So v being equal to zero, that just means that we have a horizontal line. Here we are. So there's my line for v is equal to zero. And the last one that we have, well, the last one that we have was in orange here. I'm gonna bring this down just a little bit lower that way, that way I can have space. Uh, we have this x minus y was equal to one, but under the transformation feature, we now have that v is at x minus y, which then tells us that v must be equal to one. So if v is then equal to one, here we go, v is equal to one, we now have this horizontal line. Now look at the region that we now have that region that we now have that we're focusing on is this rectangular region here. And I'm gonna call this region something else. All right, let's call this region D. All right, because it's definitely not the same as region R that we started with. All right, so now that we have this, this actually is going to be easier to integrate because notice, if we set up double integrals here, these double integrals, it's just a rectangular region. Rectangular region, well, we're allowed to use Fubini's theorem. 
So it doesn't matter which one we do, du, dv, or dv, du, because Fubini's theorem is going to say, hey, you have a rectangular region that you're integrating, uh, set up your limits of integration, and then you can interchange them as you'd like. Awesome. So let's go through and let's start then analyzing this. Well, if we initially started with the region R, and this was x minus y divided by x plus y, and this with, with this was with respect to dA, then under these transformation regions, we're going to be looking at the double integral. And again, it doesn't matter which one we go with. Limits of integration first. We could go with V's first, or we could go with U's first. All right, so I'm going to set this up. I'm going to go, uh, let's go with U's first. All right, so my U's are going to be changing. Uh, the U's are going to be changing from one to three. So it's going to be from one to three. That's going to be du. And then I'm going to set up dv. dv is going to change from zero to one, like such. x minus v, sorry, x minus y, x minus y, that was our v. x plus y, that was our u. And then we need to multiply, remember, by the Jacobian of this transformation that we are observing. We don't have the Jacobian yet, so we need to calculate that Jacobian. So let's go through. I'm going to do the Jacobian on this uh, right-hand side over here. So the Jacobian of G. All right. Again, I'm going to be looking for partial derivatives. All right. So I'm going to be looking here for the partial derivative of X with respect to U the partial derivative of x with respect to v, partial derivative of y with respect to x, and the partial derivative of y, oops, excuse me, excuse me here, uh, the, uh, the second row was partial of y with respect uh, to u, and then the partial of y with respect uh, to v, there we are. All right, now there's an issue with this. Uh, the issue being here that I don't have u and v in terms of x and y, which means we need to get them there. All right, so what I'm gonna do really quickly here is I'm gonna start interpreting what is u in terms of x and y, or sorry, what is x in terms of u and v, and what is y in terms of u and v. All right, so we got to do that really quickly. So let's go ahead and let's start working on that. All right, so that I'll probably do in a different color. See how this color looks like? Ah, look, perfect. All right, so I'm going to do this in kind of like a gold color here. All right, so I have that u is equal to x plus y, and we have that v is equal to x minus y. Perfect. All right, so I'm going to work on this right hand side, which means that V plus Y is going to be X. So let's make that substitution in here, which means U is going to be X, which is V plus Y. That was that substitution plus Y. Nice. All right, let's keep going. This is U is equal to V plus 2Y, which means if we solve this for Y, Y is going to be U minus V divided by 2. Awesome. So now we have Y in terms of U and V. Perfect. So this is one of the equations that we need in order to start finding this Jacobian here. Now, all I need to do is find, well, what is x? All right, so I already have y in terms of uv, so all I'm going to do is I'm going to substitute this in here. All right, so let's go with that. So I have v plus y, y was that u minus v divided by 2 is equal to x, which means in this case, let's see, that's going to be 2 over 2. All right, and then that's going to be two minus or two v minus v, so that's just going to be v. So that's going to be u plus v divided by two. And that's the second piece that I need. Awesome. 
now that I have this, I can go through and I can start then making my calculations for what I was doing over here. All right, so I'm gonna have some partial derivative of x with respect to u. So the partial of x with respect to u, that's just going to be what, one half? All right, so that's one half. Partial derivative of x with respect to v, that's gonna be another half. Partial derivative of y with respect to u, that's gonna be one half. And then the partial derivative of y with respect to v, that's negative one half. So once I find my Jacobian here, that's going to be this times this. So that's gonna be negative one fourth minus one fourth. And that's gonna give us negative one half. So when I insert this into my calculations here from zero to one, and then from one to three, and this is u divided by, or sorry, excuse me. This is V divided by U, V divided by U, and I'm gonna multiply it by the absolute value of that Jacobian. The Jacobian, as we found, was negative one half multiplied by that absolute value. There we go. Actually, let's clean this up just a little bit since I didn't really make it clear. There we go, negative one half. And this was all du dv which means that area was transformed and it's gonna be scaled by some factor of a half, all right? Again, we want it to be a positive, so there we are. Perfect. So let's go through. A half is now just going to be a constant, so this is just one half, the integral from zero to one, the integral from one to three, and this is gonna be V divided by U du dV. Awesome. Now, this is a separable integral. Because it's a separable integral, we can now evaluate from zero to one, and that's gonna be v, so that's just v dv, multiplied by one to three, and that's just going to be one over u du. All right, so let's go through here. This is going to be one half multiplied by the integral from zero to one of v dv. That's just going to be uh, one half, if I'm not mistaken. And then over here, we're gonna have uh, the integral of one divided by u, that's gonna be natural log. So what we're gonna have is the natural log of three minus the natural log of one. Uh, natural log of one is zero, so that's just the natural log of three, which means my final answer should just be one fourth natural log of three. So that initial area that we were trying to integrate over this uh, region over here, region R, that was a, re a really difficult region to integrate with double integrals. And it would be, again, equally hard trying to figure out what this integration for this integral is. Instead, we applied some transformation and we made it easier on ourselves in order to be able to calculate this integration really smooth and really easy. All right, so this is the technique that we use and this is the change of variables that we'd like to observe. All right, so let's work with uh, different examples and then, we'll, uh, and then we'll move on from there. All right, so here goes the next example. Evaluate, we're gonna say the integral for the region R for e to the power of xy dA, where R is the region enclosed by the lines y is equal to one half x and y is equal to x and the hyperbolas y is equal to one over x and y is equal to two over x. All right. What we're gonna wanna do here is we're gonna want to start looking at these regions. All right, so one thing I'm gonna do here is I'm gonna add to this just a little bit more. I'm gonna say sketch. 
the region R and its image. So we have two things that we want to do. We want to sketch the region R, then we want to sketch its image once we find the transformation that we're looking for. That way we can then start evaluating this double integral using those transformation techniques. All right, so here we go. All right, so what we want to do once again is first sketch this. And again, I'm drawing two axes here specifically because I want to draw uh, the first region that I'm going to be integrating. And then I want to draw the image of the region that is being integrated over. So what I'm given here is, again, I'm given my integral in terms of x's and y's. So I'm going to put in in terms of x's and y's. And I'm going to be transforming into u's and v's, all right, just as such. All right, so I need a scale now. So I'm going to put a scale here. That way we can go ahead and work with this. There we go. All right, so I'm going to grab my first uh, my first value here, which was y is equal to one half x. So y is equal to one half times x. Uh, that's just going to be a straight line going through the origin. So I have my origin intercept there, and then if x is one, then that means it's going to be one half. Uh, but it's going to be more imperative if we do two. There we are. If x is 2, then we naturally get that y is equal to 1. So I'm going to come over here. I'm going to grab my ruler here. And go with a nice intercept here. All right, there we are. So this here is y is equal to 1 half x. Then I'm going to grab y is equal to x, y is equal to x. All right, and that one's going to be at 1, 1. There we go. That one's going to be more of a 45 degree angle. There we are. Perfect. All right, and again, this one was y is equal to x. All right, and I'm going to grab the purple one here. This is going to be y is equal to 1 over x. y is equal to 1 over x, that's a hyperbola. All right, if uh, x is 1, then we're naturally at 1, 1. All right, uh, if x is 2, then we're at 1 half. But if x is 1 half, then we must be at 2, right up here. So this hyperbola looks like this. This is, again, that 1 over x. And then the last one, oops, excuse me. This one was uh, y is equal to 1 over x. And then the last one that we're going to be working with uh, for now is going to be y is equal to 2x. So when y is equal to 2 divided by x, uh, if x is 2, if x is 2, then we're naturally at 1. All right, so we're right here. And if x is, uh, let's say, at 1, if x is 1, then we must be at 2. Perfect. Uh, if x is 4, then we're going to be at 1 half. So let's go one more. There we are. So if x is 4, then we're naturally at 1 half. There we are. So this hyperbola looks like this. 
And we can see here that these hyperbolas and these lines actually make a region that we want to integrate over, and that's going to be this region here. That's going to be the region that we're focusing on. All right, so now it's time to draw this uh, transform this transformed region. In other words, it's trying to it's time to draw the, its image. So we now have to develop some function that will make that transformation. Notice we are not given that transformation function, so we have to find it ourselves. All right. Now, one of the things that I'm going to say is that you want to look at two things. Those two things being the bounds that you are given and the integrand that you're trying to integrate. Notice that your integrand has x times y. So if we can manipulate some way somehow to get some x times y, then naturally we're going to get a substitution that we could then make. So looking at your green, orange, purple, and light blue equations down here below, we need to try to interpret, can we ever get some form of x times y? And if you notice, these last two equations will automatically give us x times y. Now, I might hear you say, well, why is that? Well, when you multiply these two here, or when you multiply by x, we get x times y is equal to 1. And then on this next equation, when we multiply by x, we get x times y is equal to 2. So here's kind of one of our first transformations that we want. We want to kind of interpret x times y to be one of our transformations. Okay, that's going to be nice. All right, so we have some x times y. Now let's see what else we can get from here. All right, see if we can extract something else that's going to be beneficial to us. All right, so what I'm going to do at this point in time is, let's see, I like y is equal to x, but what if I manipulate this as y over x? Then I just get it's equal to 1. What if I manipulate this one here, the first equation, to once again be y over x? Now this is giving me 1 half. So it kind of leads me to believe now that y over x is going to be my different transformation. That different transformation would then be that v is equal to y over x. That's not bad. That's actually really good. And that's really good in the sense that we can now start trying to graph this transformation based off of these two values that we have. All right. What this is going to tell us then is we're going to use these transformations to then show us that, well, what was the first, or let's start from the left hand side. From the left hand side here, we now get under these conditions that V is equal to one half. Under these conditions, we now get that v is equal to 1. Under the u conditions, under the u condition, we now get that u is equal to 1. And then finally, we get that u is also equal to 2. So applying this transformation here, we can now extract these given values. So let's go through and let's plug these in. All right. Let's go ahead, one, two, three, four. Let's get a good scale here. All right, here we go. So I'm gonna go with V is equal to one half. Now, V being equal to one half, that means that I'm going to have this horizontal line. Let's get it going good there. There we are. All right, so here is where I have V is equal to one half. Nice. The next condition is that V is equal to 1. So I'm going to go with V is equal to 1. Here we are. There we are. V is equal to 1. Nice. 
Uh, I'm going to go with u is equal to 2. Whoa, what just happened? There we go. All right, so let's go with v is equal to 2. There we go, 90 degree measurement. All right, and the last one I need is that u is equal to 1. So here we have u is equal to 1, perfect. And then here we have that u is equal to 2, which means this area was then transformed and we're now looking at this area here. We're gonna call this area D. And that's gonna be the area that we then want to integrate. So we wanna integrate over this area. Awesome. So, as we start then looking at this, we're gonna start going through and start extracting what could our Jacobian be, all right? So that's one of the things that we're going to be looking at is what is that Jacobian? All right, so let's find that Jacobian. Now, typically what you want to do is you want to work with the Jacobian uh, so you can find some values within that transformation to be in terms of U's and V's, right? Uh, because under the assumption that we have for that Jacobian, that Jacobian of the transformation for G as we knew was given by this. Just like this, right? And that was from uh, the definition that we had for the Jacobian that we were looking at when we were looking at this right in here. And I'll circle this one here, all right? So when we start looking at that, oh, que pasó? I think it's everything's good, all right? so. When we start looking at that here, what if we don't solve for x and y? What if we want to keep everything in terms of uh, u is equal to x, y, and then v is equal to y over x? Well, that means that this Jacobian is kind of uh, turned upside down. Or, again, what we did is we took its inverse, like such, uh, which means this is no longer the Jacobian here, but instead it's just a Jacobian of g, once we identify its inverse. So in this sense, I don't need to come over here and I don't need to solve for x and for y. I don't need to put x, sorry, I don't need to put the function for x in terms of u's and v's and the function of y in terms of u's and v's. I can just go through and calculate this specific Jacobian and see what I get. All right, so I want my Jacobian here, my Jacobian for g is going to be the inverse of this Jacobian here, all right? Which is going to be the partial of u with respect to v. So let's work with the partial of u with respect to v first, all right? So I'm gonna say, let's work here. Partial of u with respect to x. In this sense, partial of u with respect to x is just y partial of u with respect to y. All right, partial of u with respect to y, that's just x. Nice, looking good so far. All right, so this is just y, this is just x so far. And then you can go through the rest of the partial derivatives. The partial of u with respect, uh, sorry, the partial of v, partial of v with respect to x, partial of v with respect to x, that's going to be negative y over x squared. All right, take the next derivative, derivative of uh, v with respect, derivative of v with respect to y, that's going to be just one over x. There we are, which means we multiply. So this is gonna be y over x plus, that's gonna be x times y over x squared. So that should be y over x, which means we get two y over x like such. But remember, what is y over x? y over x, that's just v, which means this must be, it's just two times v. 
So the inverse, or at least the Jacobian inverse that we're looking for here is 2v, but again, we need that Jacobian, which means the Jacobian for g is just going to be 1 half v. So again, there was no need to actually go through and solve for x and for y and put them in terms of u and v if we can just go through this process. Nice. So let's go ahead and let's start setting this up now, now that we have everything that we need. All right, so we had the double integral over the region r, and that was for e to the power of x, y, and that was going to be with respect uh, to dA. There we are, perfect. And this was again in Cartesian coordinates. And what I'm gonna do here is I'm gonna set this up now. I'm gonna go to my integral. Wow. Here we go, I'm gonna go to my integral here. And I'm gonna start setting up this integral. I'm probably gonna want it to be uh, du dv. So my u's are changing. U's are changing between one and two. V's are changing between one half and one. That's one half and one. And that's gonna be e to the power of x times y, but x times y was that uh, u that we put in. And then the absolute value of that Jacobian, which was one over two v. Now to evaluate this, uh, the one half, that's just a constant, which means that's one half, and then we integrate from one half to one, and then we go from one to two, and this is gonna be for e to the u, one over v du dv. Nice. Now again, this is a rectangular region, which means Fubini's theorem works, which means we could either set up dv du as long as we match those limits of integration. Now, this integral is separable, and because it is separable, we are able to integrate one half to one, and that was dv, so that means this is gonna be one over v dv, and we're gonna multiply this by one to two for that integral, and that's gonna be e, whoa, and that's going, let's try to erase that, there we go and that's going to be e to the power of u, and that's going to be du. Awesome. So let's see, this is going to be one half. This first piece right here is going to integrate uh, into a natural log, and when we integrate this into a natural log, we will get the natural log of one minus the natural log of one half. Nice. And then this is going to integrate to just e to the u. So this is going to be e to the power of two minus e to the power of one. Awesome. Now let's go ahead and simplify a little bit more. This is just one half multiplied by e squared minus e. And then this in here, natural log of one, that's gonna naturally go to zero. And then natural log of one half, I can rewrite that without the negative if I interpret it as just the natural log of two. Remember, natural log of one half, this is really one over two, which is uh, two to the power of negative one. Negative one is the exponent, move that exponent forward, and that's negative one times a positive, sorry, negative one times a negative, which makes it a positive, which means this is our final answer. And there you have it. This is the method of substitution for multiple integrals, or as we like to call it, this is the change of variables with these integrals, all right? So I hope you all enjoy this lesson and I will see you all next time ready for chapter 16.